welcome to this video series on trees and tree-based data structures. In this series, we'll cover several topics. We'll start with some basic background and fundamental definitions and terminology. In subsequent parts, we'll cover basic implementations and fundamental algorithms for trees, including various traversal strategies. We'll then cover how we can use trees as general collection data structures as binary search trees and heaps. In this first part, we'll give some motivation for studying trees and develop the terminology, concepts, and properties that make trees a good basis for various data structures. Along the way, we'll develop more and more structure in our trees that we'll be able to exploit for efficient operations. In previous lessons, one of the overriding goals has been to develop data structures that allow us to store elements in an efficient manner. For a data structure to be generally useful, all three basic operations, including insertion, retrieval, and deletion, need to be made efficient. Array-based lists were an improvement over plain old arrays and offered efficient index-based retrieval. If sorted, we could even use binary search for efficient arbitrary retrieval. Both of these were possible because the underlying array allowed us to exploit the random access. However, array-based lists fell short when trying to insert or remove elements, as doing so required us to shift the remaining elements up or down to make room. Linked lists solved this problem by allowing us to efficiently insert elements at either end of the list, either the head or the tail. However, it came at a cost. An index-based retrieval was no longer a constant operation, as we had to traverse the list to the element that we were searching for. Likewise, arbitrary insertion or deletion were also linear, because they involved searching for the element to begin with. Stacks and queues offered efficient core operations, push and pop for stacks and NQ and DQ for queues, respectively. However, they were restricted access data structures that only allowed us to insert and retrieve elements in a very specific manner. All of these data structures have fallen short in our goal of developing a general purpose collection data structure that offers efficiency for all three of these basic operations. We now turn to another data structure that does have this potential, trees. A tree is a very special kind of graph. In particular, a tree is an acyclic graph, that is, a graph that contains no cycles. We'll generally assume a little bit of familiarity with basic graph theory. If you don't have the necessary background, some resources are available on our website. In short, however, for our purposes, a tree is a collection of nodes, also called vertices, such that pairs of nodes are potentially connected by edges. Here's an example of a tree with seven nodes and six edges. A path in a tree is a sequence of connected nodes. For example, A is connected to F, which is connected to C, which is connected to G, forming a path of length three. However, no path in this tree begins and ends at the same node, as that would form a cycle. Here's another example with 11 nodes and 10 edges. Yet another example with six nodes and five edges. This example, strictly speaking, is not a tree, but a collection of two trees. The two trees are called components and are disconnected because there's no path from nodes in one component to nodes in the other. Collections of disconnected trees are usually called forests. There are several conventions that we'll use throughout our presentation. First, when talking abstractly about trees, we'll use n to denote the number of vertices. You may be familiar with other types of graphs such as directed graphs, multigraphs, etc. However, we'll restrict our attention to undirected trees. Finally, we won't consider forests, only connected trees. Already, we can make a few observations about the properties of trees. First, as you might have observed in the examples, the number of edges in a tree with n nodes is always n minus 1. Second, in any connected tree, every pair of nodes is connected by exactly one unique path. To see this, consider the following scenario. First, since the tree is connected, we are guaranteed that there's at least one path. Suppose that two nodes, U and V, are connected by some path, P1. Now suppose that a different distinct path also connects these two nodes, P2. These paths together form a cycle giving us a contradiction. You could extend this argument further for scenarios in which two vertices are connected by two paths that share some sequence of vertices. At some points, the paths must diverge, and yet, this again forms a cycle. As an immediate consequence of these two properties, we can observe that trees are highly structured graphs. Since there are only a linear number of edges, they are also sparse graphs, thus connectivity is limited and predictable. We may be able to exploit these properties to design an efficient data structure. 
Still, we'll want to induce even more structure, mainly for convenience, in order to develop a full data structure. In particular, we'll make it so that nodes in our tree store data, and we'll orient our trees top to bottom and left to right. To illustrate this, consider the prior example. There are several ways that we could redraw this tree. Imagine picking up the tree by the node A and shaking it, allowing gravity to pull down the other nodes, attached by edges. The result would look something like this. We further organize the lower nodes in lexiographic order. Alternatively, we could have picked the graph up by the other nodes, such as B, giving us this graph, or by G, giving us this graph. In all three cases, the graphs are oriented top to bottom and left to right. Based on this orientation, we'll restrict the structure of our trees even further. First, we'll specify that no node has degree more than three. That is, every node will be connected to at most three other nodes. Thus, each node will have at most two descendant nodes below it. This induces a conceptual parent-child relationship. Further, since we're organizing horizontally, the two child nodes can be distinguished as either the left child or the right child. We'll also borrow other terminology from familial relationships, such as ancestors, descendants, siblings, etc. We depict those general relationships here. Ancestor nodes are further up in the tree, and descendant nodes are further down in the tree. Like a family tree, parents are depicted above children. What we've just defined are called binary trees, oriented trees such that each node has at most two children. The term binary is used because of this two-child limitation. Here's a larger example of a binary tree. There are several other terms that we'll use here. The node at the top with no parent is referred to as the root. Nodes with no children are referred to as leaves. All other nodes are generally referred to as internal nodes. We may also have noticed that our trees are, oddly, growing downward. The root is depicted at the top, and the leaves are at the bottom. This is in contrast to most organic trees that grow upward. This is mostly done for ease of presentation, as we usually read top to bottom, left to right. The original discussion of tree structures by Cayley used the same convention, and we've been growing our trees downward for over 150 years. Since all nodes are relative to the root node, we can also define the concept of depth. The depth of a node u in a binary tree is the length of the unique path from the root down to u. Remember that the length of a path is defined as the number of edges on it. By convention, the depth of the root node is itself zero. When we draw binary trees, we typically draw all nodes of the same depth at the same horizontal level. Here's the tree from before. The root node has depth zero. Its children, B and C, are at depth one. Their children are at depth two, and so on. The deepest node is R. The path from the root A to B to D to G to M to R is of length five. The depth of the tree itself is defined to be the maximal depth of any node. Thus, the depth of this tree is also five. By convention, if we have a single node tree, its depth is zero. If we have an empty tree, its depth is defined by convention to be negative one. We'll now illustrate why depth is important. Suppose that we have a full and complete binary tree of depth D. That is, both children of every node are present up to the last level, D. At level zero, we have a single node, the root. There are two nodes, the children of the root. At depth two, there are a total of four nodes. And at depth three, there are eight nodes. Continuing in this manner, the number of nodes at each level grows by powers of two. At depth D, we have two to the D nodes. The sum total of all these nodes in a tree is a geometric series. Thus, the total number of nodes, n, is equal to the sum of powers of two from zero up to our depth d. This has a well-known closed form solution of two to the d plus one minus one. Now let's understand this equation from the perspective of the depth of the tree by solving for d. Take one to the other side, take the logarithm base two, and take the other one to the other side. Thus in a full and complete binary tree, the depth is order logarithmic with respect to the number of nodes. This is the property that we're going to exploit. If we have a binary tree that stores data such that insertion, retrieval, and deletion can all be done proportional to the depth, and the binary tree is nearly full or complete, 
then all of our operations can be done in logarithmic time. This is like having the benefits and efficiency of binary search, but for every operation and without the requirement of having random access. We'll further develop these ideas in the next video. We note, however, that the logarithmic depth is not necessarily guaranteed in a tree. A binary tree may become skewed, unbalanced, or otherwise degenerate. In an extreme case, a binary tree could have every node have at most one child. Here's such a case. There are 10 nodes, but they all go to the right, giving us a depth of 9. In general, a binary tree may have depth that is linear with respect to the number of nodes. It's easy to see from this depiction that such a tree is no better than a linked list. In fact, this is exactly a linked list. In this series, we won't go into details about how to avoid this, but it is possible, and we'll discuss several solutions later on.